Omori is a special game to me. Never before has a game so thoroughly grabbed and commanded both my attention and feelings throughout all 30 of the hours I spent playing it, and I doubt that any game will resonate with my emotions so powerfully and portray my experiences with mental health in such vivid clarity ever again. I spent the entire night after finishing Omori just crying until I fell asleep, only to wake up the next day and cry for half of that day as well due to just how beautiful the story was and how heart-wrenchingly well it was told. And I expect to cry many, many more times as I'm editing this video. To me, Omori was a true masterpiece that went to a level beyond just excellence in all aspects in order to deliver an experience that was so truly personal and touching that it could never again be replicated for me. This video will detail my own journey with Amori and why it impacted me as much as it did, as well as me gushing just in general about how elegantly the experience is communicated to the player through gameplay, music, and presentation. However, before I continue with the video, to me, Amori is a game that is best experienced fully blind. As such, if you haven't beaten the game for yourself yet, I'd recommend completing it and forming your own experience with it before hearing my thoughts and opinions. However, if you're someone who hasn't completed the game and the horror or trigger warnings made you want to enjoy the game at your own pace through YouTube, then I fully support that and hope that my experiences can still echo what you may have felt when watching it. Considering you've made it past the spoiler warning, then you're already aware of the basic premise that Amori introduces us to. The dual narratives of Sunny's shut-in life in the real world and his more fantastical inner experiences as Amori in an idealized dream world comprised of sweeter memories he has so desperately clung onto from his innocent childhood of four years ago. The environments that form Sunny's dreamscape are portrayed in such various vivid flavors that make them all vibrant and unique. From the eerily quiet, yet charmingly humble vast forest, to the bombastic and loud halls of Sweetheart's Castle, Sunny's dreams offer no shortage of imagination. My personal favorite dream world area will always be the quirky and beautifully pastel Otherworld. Its old video gamey and otherworldly aesthetics perfectly capture the naive joy of being drawn into media such as games or music as a child, as a result, it never let me escape this nostalgic and comforting feeling the entire time that I was exploring the planet. And yet, regardless of how adventurous and playful these dream world segments are, the area in which all of Amori's childishly fun adventures stem from is the utterly barren and devoid white space. This hopeless expanse is where all of Amori's adventures begin and end, to serve as a brutal reminder of how hollow this escapist fantasy truly is. What stands in stark contrast to both the devoid white space and surreal environments of the dreamscape is the real world beyond Sunny's house. The real world outside is my favorite location in the entire game, as well as where I found the best sequences in the game to be. All too easy would it have been for the game's creator, Omocat, to make the real world a drab, boring area to explore, to stand perhaps in stark contrast to the immediately visually appealing dreamscape areas to maybe convey that fantasy is more captivating than reality. However, instead of this, the real world is portrayed as being equally as charming and full of life as the dreamscape, with its own colorful cast of oddballs such as Angel and the Maverick and its own unique sense of adventure through the lovely companionship of Kel. Although the side quests, in the form of chores in the real world, are made intentionally more mundane than their dream world counterparts, they still encourage you to further explore and grow attached to the diverse range of personalities outside. This particular cultivation of an entirely separate and yet positive affiliation with the real world that grows more and more as you reacquaint yourself with Hero and later Aubrey meant that, for me, by the end of the game, I was more in love and attached to the real world than the dreamscape. Exploring the little oddities of the town on the final day with all three friends reunited once again truly felt like an emotional highlight of the story in both bittersweet sadness and true raw happiness. This growing attachment to the real world that I felt while playing through the game 
beautifully mirrored Sonny's own reintegration back into society beyond just the walls of his house, and serves as a recognition by both Sonny and the player that the real world still has so much whimsy and joy left to be found in it. For as comforting as Otherworld felt in its nostalgic, retro aesthetic, or how soothing the vast forest is in its peaceful humility, their positive atmospheres all fade the same as their twisted origin as failing methods of escapism are laid bare to the player. Sunny's dreamscape represents a world of complete stagnation. A world where Kel will never be able to grow taller than his older brother. A world where Aubrey will never be able to dye her hair for Mari and find more of her own friends. And a world in which Sunny will never be able to become good enough at the violin to perform that final recital with Mari. And as you delve deeper and learn more, such as who the various skeletons littered around the world once were, the jubilant adventures of you and your party descend further and further into horrible nightmares, made all the more haunting by Omori's chilling silence in the face of it all. Undoubtedly, the game does not shy away from the fact that the real world has its dark side too, as we are forced to accept in the tragic interactions with both Basil and Aubrey on the first day with that painful, lingering reminder that Sonny's time with his friends, no matter how positive or negative it may end up being, cannot last for much longer. However, beneath all this fear and pain in the real world, there is a true underlying optimism that things will improve. Even Sonny simply just stepping out of his house on the first day is a powerful moment in his growth and the continuous and increasingly sweet interactions with the townsfolk and friends are comforting in a far more natural and elegant way than their dream world counterparts. Thus, Amori is able to utilize its presentation and world building to allow the player to feel Sunny's growing optimism and hope in the real world alongside him, to deliver the powerful message to the player that the real world is not worth giving up on, no matter how hard things may be. Amori's gameplay also works beautifully to reinforce its story. Although I won't be touching on the battle gameplay too much on the whole, as it wasn't what particularly grabbed me while I was playing the game, I will still say that it is an incredibly enjoyable battle system that kept me engaged from start to finish. That being said though, there were some neat details within the battle system that I'd like to touch on, such as how the emotions of the dream world characters are so easy to change, while the real world counterparts rarely stray from neutral emotions, just to show how inhumane and hyper fantasized the party members in the dream world actually are. And Amori himself being able to reach third tier emotions, while his party cannot, serves as cute foreshadowing of his status as a boss character later on in the game. However, the main praise that I have for Amori's gameplay is in how it chooses to limit the player in support of the narrative. This idea is first forced onto the player in the white space when you return there after the incident with Basil's disappearance. Regardless of whatever the player may want to do in the situation, regardless of how awful the only option is, all the player can do in this scenario is force Amori to stab themselves. And as the game progresses, and you have to repeat the same process over and over again, having Amori stab himself becomes less horrifying and more of just a normalized process to the player, which tragically mirrors how Sunny himself has, over time, gradually begun to accept and grown accustomed to hurting himself mentally. Omori's dialogue in the final boss fight serves as the culmination of all of these thoughts which Sunny has used to hurt himself, making his triumph and acceptance of Omori at the end of the game even more powerful. Another heart-wrenching instance of how this technique is used is basically every interaction Sunny has with the real Basil. It's pretty clear to see from Basil's first scene in the real world that he's an anxious wreck in need of support. This is where Sunny, being a silent protagonist, works as a perfect emotional weapon to hurt the player with. No matter how much the player may want Sunny to give support or encouragement to Basil, he cannot do so. It is not within Sunny's capacity to give Basil the support he desires through conversation, with the awkward silence between Sunny and Basil in the first real world day serving as the perfect example of Sunny's limitations. These two former best friends had not spoken to each other for four years before this day, 
And all Sunny has to offer Basil in this moment is complete and utter silence. None of the pain I just mentioned, though, compares to the scene that occurs in Basil's bathroom. Both Sunny and the players share powerlessness in this situation, forced me to take a break in order to recover. As someone who is friends with their own mental issues, seeing Sunny so utterly incapable of helping felt like a true nightmare given form. This scene is made all the more interesting in retrospect due to the fact that Sunny willingly chooses to jump into the lake on the second day in order to save Basil from drowning. Despite the fact that Sunny is well aware that he cannot swim and is still afraid of drowning. This indicated to me that Sunny wants to help Basil, but is unable to do so due to his own emotional and mental limitations. All these scenes culminate in a beautiful moment on the third day, when you approach Basil's room and are finally given the option for the first time, do you want to save Basil? Indicating Sunny's mental growth to finally be capable of reaching out to support Basil for the first time in four agonizing years. Although the fight with Basil that follows shows Sunny's limitations once again as we lose access to calming down, focusing, and persisting, this moment of the player and Sunny finally being given the option to help Basil is monumental. This effect is also achieved when Sunny is finally able to break his silence in the good ending and say, I have to tell you something. We feel Sunny's personal limitations as a player just as he does. So when he grows, we are equally able to feel and celebrate the successes alongside him. It's an absolutely incredible storytelling technique that gives the player such incredible insight into the perspective of an otherwise silent protagonist, and results in Sunny managing to feel like one of the most intricate characters despite only having six real words of spoken dialogue. Speaking of Amori's characters, the main cast is where I found the true heart of the game to reside with each character being fleshed out so compellingly in their own ways that I was thoroughly in love with them all by the end. Just as the world building of the game makes you care about the real world, the incredibly touching and down-to-earth relationships found between each of Sunny's friends further your emotional investment into the story. As much as I'd like to analyse each of these characters in some more appealing, objective format like I did with the presentation and gameplay, I find that Amori's main cast relate too personally to me for me to ever be capable of separating my own experiences and feelings from them. Take Hero, for instance. His own resilient and yet entirely optimistic personality makes him the most ideal older sibling or friend that anyone could ever ask for. His consistent and unfaltering sense of responsibility makes him a natural caretaker for the group, and his absence on the first day is so potent at removing a reliable safety net from beneath the cast and pushing uneasiness onto the player truly making his importance felt. However, Amori also sometimes shows us another side of Hero, when his capable outwards image falters and stumbles, and his insecurities are laid out on full display. This is used to provide alleviating comedy in some instances, but also heart-wrenching dread in others. Hearing from Kel about the depressive episode Hero struggled through after Mari's death, the somber scene of him being left to mourn by Mari's piano, and the tragic sense of responsibility he still attempts to maintain in spite of everything when Basil takes his own life in the neutral route are so emotionally destructive because of how well the player has gotten to know the charming and optimistic hero, thus serving to further ground and complete his character. As an old sibling myself, who is soon to move away from home for university, the personal connection I feel towards Hero should be unsurprising. His currently unfulfilled dreams of being a chef resonated with my own feelings of missed opportunities or goals that I've lost along the way, and personal struggles through a dark period of a year or so that disrupt all normalcy is something that I've also had to experience personally. The player has provided so much insight into Hero through so many angles that it's difficult not to grow an attachment to him, as will be a common theme throughout the rest of the cast. You watching right now likely have unfulfilled ambitions. You may have dealt with prolonged experiences of sadness or grief, perhaps due to losing a loved one or otherwise. You may be an older sibling who wants to be a positive influence on your younger siblings. Or you may be none of these, but still relate to Hero's character 
in other aspects. Relatability is a word of praise that has been stripped of much of its meaning online nowadays, but the grounded approach Amori takes to characterization and portraying mental health issues in particular makes it hard to describe the cast with just about any other word. Indeed, many other games have characters with struggles that are relatable in some form, but the cast of Amori in particular are given such a sense of realism and life that allows the player to form an even stronger connection with them. Taking just Hero alone as an example is enough to show how thoroughly each of Amori's cast are constructed. In particular, it's the down-to-earth portrayal of mental health issues and the extent to which they affect each cast member, which served as a highlight in the writing of Amori for me that was completely unrivaled by any other game that I've played. I have to deal with social anxiety and depression in my own life. And seeing these issues portrayed in such a realistic capacity throughout the different characters in the game added a new level of depth to the experience for me that just made me fall even further in love with the cast. Aubrey's own conflicted emotions of abandonment by her friends, which led her on her own personal journey of understanding about what her friends were also suffering through, which led them to drifting apart, was a powerful realization in the story that I think is important for all people with this shared feeling to see. Her rebellious streak into delinquency to try to avoid these feelings, and her own incapabilities of properly communicating her feelings to either Sunny or Kel, are all too realistic in terms of struggles, particularly as a teenager. I adore how the game goes out of its way to not portray Aubrey's rebellious nature as something inherently violent or dangerous, as we see with her friends being more of lovably silly teens than real genuine threats and actually being a true supportive and positive influence in her life. The real Aubrey serves functionally as an antagonist for the majority of the game, and yet I found it hard to ever see her as anything but a deeply hurt friend who is also in need of help. Kel, on the other hand, is someone who we never really get a glimpse into the deeper mental health of. Instead, the game chooses to portray him as a lovably naive friend to Sunny. It's really hard to understate just how infectious Kel's spirit is, and Sunny's entire journey having kicked into motion by the persistence of a friend who truly cares enough to not give up is absolutely touching, and something we see reiterated as important later in the game when all the friends choose to wait for Basil outside of his room. As Hero says, Last time, we all made the mistake of leaving each other when we needed each other the most. And it's touching how Sunny has already been shown how true these words are due to Kel's persistence. I find the real beauty in Kel's character to emerge when his naivete hits a wall. We see this in his simple-minded attitude being more of a hindrance than a help when trying to reconcile with Aubrey. Kel can't solve everything on his own, and we're shown that bluntly, especially when he is completely unable to look far enough into Basil's words to see how much he's truly hurting. Thus, for all his simplicity, Kel ends up being a character who is rich in his own depth while still being an overwhelmingly fun personality to have around that balances the darker tone of the real world segments perfectly. And when his positivity in the real world does start to slip, Hero is reintroduced at the perfect moment to pick up the slack for his younger brother and maintain an underlying sense of optimism. Working opposite to this optimism, however, are the two darkest characters in the game, Sunny and Basil, both of whom ended up resonating with me far more than any other character in perhaps any fiction ever, and I'm sure if the endless swarm of Sunny and Basil profile pictures that I see on social media are any indication, I'm not alone in feeling this sentiment. As previously mentioned, Sunny's character is unfolded to the player slowly over the duration of the game. We empathize with him because we feel his limitations, have to experience the nightmarish horror of his mental trauma alongside him, and explore a world constructed from his thoughts and experiences. Although his first line of dialogue is in the final scene of the game, I'd argue that we hear his voice and thoughts in a far more vivid clarity than any dialogue could ever do justice to. Sunny's desperate attempt to cling on to a past of sweeter, more innocent times manifests the dream world, and his attempt to no longer feel the pain of emotional trauma by discarding his feelings is symbolized by the dark light bulb, which ends up just further detaching him from reality in the process. Yet, the ugly, hideous truth that Sunny has run from 
still finds a way to intrude upon his false sanctuary. The black space is the ultimate culmination of these repressed feelings, thoroughly locked away deep within Sunny's psyche to prevent them from ever being fully acknowledged. The player here is able to bear witness to the darkest depths of Sonny's thoughts through a window into the intrusive thoughts that have plagued him for the past four years. The black space is not an indication to me that Sonny secretly wants to murder Basil or Miwo, but rather represents horrible thoughts that have entered his mind and instead of being addressed by Sonny for their inaccurate nature, were actively repressed instead. An example I noticed was that whenever Basil was killed off in the black space, it was typically after he asked Sonny for help, or after asking him if he can tell him something, which suggests to me not that Sonny actually wants to kill Basil, but instead that he'd been mentally struggling with constantly listening to the worries of others, as Aubrey and Basil both admit they relied on Sonny to do for them. These thoughts deep within the black space aren't suggestive of who Sonny is as a person, his actions are what gets to decide that. Just as Sonny can come to terms with his inner self all he wants, he cannot save Basil or any of his friends by merely saving a version of them that exists inside of his head, with a non-good ending serving as a brutal reminder of this fundamental truth. This is also why the good and secret endings are so perfectly crafted to me. Sonny's own choice to act and not just remain locked away in his mind to tell his friends the truth this is what ultimately makes his something fade away, and allows him, and Basil both, to smile again. Basil himself is a character that we are given far less time with than the other characters I've mentioned thus far, and yet the most emotional pain I felt while playing the game revolved almost solely around him. There's something about how such an empathetic and kind person is drowning alone in sadness and guilt that is truly heart-wrenching. Each day that you're unable to truly help him, as your time until the move draws nearer, serve as an excruciatingly stressful impetus upon the player, to the extent that even though I was thoroughly enjoying the real world side quest, I abandoned almost all of them on the final day to go to Basil's house. Perhaps it's my own experience dealing with mental health issues, or knowing that my friends have previously and still are struggling with their own mental problems that made Basil's story so heartbreaking to experience for me. Although I certainly wouldn't claim that you need to have mental health problems or a friend with them in order to love and enjoy Basil as a character, as Amori does craft his character in such a way to make him incredibly saddening and empathizable regardless of any of that, I would say however though that understanding these types of issues adds another layer of depth and relatability to Basil, making it wholly unsurprising that he's a character who so many have found attachment to, with him seemingly being the most popular character in the game, in spite of his far more limited screen time. Omori doesn't just settle with having amazing, nuanced characters though. Instead, the game utilizes its impressive cast to further drive the story forward in beautiful ways. Whether it's through the tag system that provides sweet snapshots into each character's relationships, which can be juxtaposed next to their stunted Dreamworld counterparts, or a Basil's photo album, which to me felt like the true culmination of all the characters and their relationships. Placing all the missing photos together and flipping through the photo album with all of Basil's innocent descriptions for the last time was a truly transcendent moment of storytelling that kept me crying throughout the entire duration. It's a standout bittersweet moment in a game full of melancholy, as Sonny and his friends all reminisce on past memories for the last time together, in a far more healthy and natural way than Sonny's attempts at escapism through the dreamscape. Things have changed since all of these photos were last taken, and most certainly for the worst. However, remembering the positive memories and still finding the strength to press on to create new, even better memories together is what they all resolve to do in this moment. It's scary, leaving behind the past. Those simpler times when everything just seemed perfect. But the bonds the cast has forged with one another allow them to move forward into this unknown future. Basil's proposition to Sunny that they should make new memories together is a beautiful moment for this reason and it being followed by Sonny revisiting each of his memories from that idyllic, blissful period of his life and actively having to choose to leave them all 
to allow him the possibility of a future filled with new memories is a moment that moved me so deeply that I'm not sure any words I could possibly muster here would ever be able to do it justice. Sonny's friends gave him the strength to push forward and reach this resolution, so that when the time comes for his solo performance, he is ready to face himself and the unknown future ahead all on his own. Speaking of this final boss fight is a great way to segue into another incredible aspect of the game, the music. Anyone who has experienced Omori or simply heard the OST alone can tell you how special it is. The title screen music for instance is a somber song with a faint but monotonous ringing in the background to perfectly capture the endlessly devoid and sad life Sunny has lived in the years prior to the start of the game. The theme of the vast forest, spaces in between, is almost hollow in its quality, repeating a familiar soft tune throughout the entire duration. However, although this gives the track some semblance of security or comfort, the distorted audio quality creates the underlying feeling of a world, and by extension Sunny's mental state, as something on the brink of collapse. These very same, distorted effects make a reappearance as a motif in the final boss track, Omori Alter. With them, in this instance, serving as an overpowering representation of Omori's, and by extension Sunny's, own inner hatred and resistance to change. And yet, Sunny's violin that he mended by accepting himself and plays with the resolution to move forward never succumbs to the sheer force of Omori's harsh sound and self-hating dialogue, always persisting in the background no matter how drowned out it becomes. It is a theme of Sunny's inner conflict, of his terrible, self-hating anguish which has been fed for four long years fighting desperately to prevent the resolved Sunny from moving on with his life. By Your Side is also a clear standout track to anyone who's played the game, and personally serves as an immediate cry switch whenever I listen to it. What I love in particular is the distant and out of time violin that persists in the background of the song, unable to keep pace and consistency with Mari's piano. Of course, representing not only Sunny's past failed attempts to keep pace with his sister prior to the recital, but also his stagnation within the dreamscape where this song plays where he tragically surrenders that he will never be able to grow to truly play alongside her. At least, not until he chooses to discard the dreamscape and finally move on and embrace reality, with this powerful moment of growth being accompanied by the track duet, in which Sunny is finally able to not only perform the duet with Mari that he was never able to make happen, but he also finally resolves himself to finish the song all on his own. Sonny has now allowed himself to move on and grow, and is now ready to face his friends. Omori isn't a game that requires you to have killed your sister in an accident to understand and relate to. It's a game about forgiving yourself for your mistakes and flaws, about confronting reality and escaping the serene yet hopeless expanse of memories that our minds can retreat to in dark times. It's about finding beauty and joy in the world around you, accepting change and letting go of the comfort of the past to welcome in the new memories of happiness and joy in the future. It's a game about grief and loss, about the pain of growing apart from friends and the fear of making mistakes that will one day hurt them. But most of all, Omori to me is a game about acceptance, about learning to accept and trust in your friends for who they are so they can start to accept and love themselves too. 
It's about learning to accept the pain of the past and pressing forward to find the hope and possibilities still out there in spite of it all. It's about learning to accept yourself for not only your imperfections, but for everything that makes you unique, for the aspects that make others care about you and cherish you, and for everything that makes you so, so deserving of love. This was my personal journey with Amori, and why it will always hold a special place in my heart. These are just some post video thoughts now that I've finished recording and editing most of the video. This video was difficult for me to make. In fact, it was actually probably the most difficult creative process I've had in my entire life. It's just something about how Amori was a game that gave me such a special experience that I think will last with me forever, and that was actually quite paralyzing trying to make this video. How could I possibly capture all the words and thoughts and feelings that I'd experienced since playing the game? I quickly came to the realization that uh, typing it all out on a script, I couldn't make it happen exactly how I wanted it to. Yet, talking to friends and, well, going back over the game, the themes, and what it taught me, I realized that I have to accept the end result I have to accept what I'm able to do and be proud of it. Be proud of the video that I'm putting out, be proud of the effort that I put into it, and accepting that it won't be perfect, but at least it's there at all. And I'm very thankful for that, and I'm thankful that you made it through to the end of this video to hear all of this.